In the 1970s, scientists created the internet for the US government. But by the 90s, the internet had become a global communication network for everyone. It grew fast, much faster than any communication medium in human history. The internet allowed people to communicate instantly. And information that was once hard to find was just a quick search away. It served citizens, businesses, and governments, and helped create an explosion of economic growth. But the makeup of the internet posed unexpected challenges. People could reach across geographical boundaries, great for commerce, but some saw a threat to national sovereignty. With social media, people could meet and organize in new ways, and they found a powerful tool for political dissent. Some governments reacted by monitoring their citizens online and built firewalls that kept the information out. Some even want to build their own internets, cut off from the rest of the world. And now, internet restrictions are growing in many parts of the world. The future of free access to information is uncertain. Some believe an open internet threatens their culture, their stability, and their sovereignty. Others believe the free flow of information leads to growth and fosters more open, prosperous societies. Today, we all face critical questions about how to achieve the right balance between political freedom and national security, between free markets and global regulations to protect consumers, between respect for cultural traditions and the universal right to speak one's mind and be heard. How do we ensure that the internet remains free, an open platform for progress and change, a place that's truly at liberty Good morning. I'm Bob Borston, and I'm Director of Public Policy at Google here in Washington, DC. I want to welcome you all to Washington and to the second Internet at Liberty Conference. Uh, a special welcome to the repeat offenders from Budapest. Uh, there are a number of you in this room, and I appreciate you coming all the way here. Happy to welcome our first time participants as well and uh, all those who are watching live on CitizenTube. Uh, I want to thank, to begin with, Shelby Coffey and everyone here at the museum uh, for hosting us. And a big thanks to our staff uh, from Google and our events folks who you will meet over the next couple of days. A couple of housekeeping items before we move into uh, this morning's program. The agenda for the next two days and the map of the rooms that you'll be using is around your neck. Today is Wednesday, just to remind everybody. And you have to pull it out and open it in order to see the Wednesday schedule. This was told to me by one annoying conference participant who shall go unnamed. Uh, Thursday is actually on the back if you're looking at it the wrong way. So please refer to this map and these things without, if you have any questions about that or ask uh, one of the people who says Internet at Liberty staff on their shirt. Um, the Twitter handle is at Internet Liberty for those of you who need to know. Uh, and the uh, wireless is uh, on this card as well. This event is open to the press. Uh, everything you can say uh, will be used against you. Uh, and there are, however, areas in this room and all of the rooms where there are no cameras to be used. And they are marked by the no camera access area signs. Um, so finally, and this is for those of you who came from abroad. Some of you may see email messages in the next day or two from Altour, A-L-T-O-U-R. If you want to go home, look at those messages. That's all I'll say. Now, on to our program. You are surrounded here by some very interesting people. More than 300 uh, participants drawn from more than 30 countries. Uh, huge diversity in life experience and cultural backgrounds and age, he said, as one of the older people involved in the Google universe. But one thing unites us, and that is 
We all know that the future of the Internet is critical, and the ability to express oneself freely online has huge geopolitical, social, and economic impacts. Over the next two days, we hope that you learn some very interesting things. But most important, we want you to speak up, to participate, to, and you'll excuse the expression, freely express yourself. I would urge you to do so when you're asking a question in a brief, timely, and polite manner. Facts and data are welcome, of course, but so are opinions. And if you hear something that you think is outrageous, short-sighted, foolish, or just plain wrong, except if I say it, please speak up. Don't just whisper to your neighbor, as fun as that can be. Stand up and tell us all what you're thinking. That's what we're here to do. Over the next two days, you're going to witness and participate in debates about some of the key issues facing us and issues raised by the video we've just seen. We're going to talk about the role of governments, the role of companies, the role of NGOs, and the role of a lot of individuals in this room. You're going to have a chance to attend workshops that are meant to teach practical skills in everything from using video for political change to uh, keeping safer while on a mobile device. And right now, let me thank the unpaid, incredibly hardworking workshop leaders and presenters. You know who you are. We really appreciate your help. You're also going to have a chance to see the latest in research and some really cool tools that people are developing in this area. Feel free to engage with the folks at the kiosks, which are in the next room during the breaks. They have various research projects and ongoing things to discuss with you, and they're here to talk. Most important, we want you to learn something new and to have a good time. Although I realize that second idea may be a bit foreign to the academics and government officials in the audience, <laughs> please at least give it a try. Why are we here? We believe that the ability to freely express ourselves is a shared value that crosses oceans, national borders, culture, and history. And while there's never a bad time to talk about values, this is a particularly good time, a crucial year for the cause of Internet freedom, a year when the idea that information and data should flow freely across national borders is under assault. First. Filtering and monitoring is increasing. Since we last got together in Budapest in 2010, about 120 million more people are living in countries that systematically filter online content. Second, crucial changes afoot in many important countries and in international organizations. This is particularly true in the emerging democracies or what some call the global swing states, places like India, Indonesia, Brazil, Egypt, Thailand, and Tunisia. Many of these places are considering legislation and regulations that would gravely slow, if not strangle, the flow of information. Third, there is a growing realization that while we must never stop promoting human rights, keeping the Internet open and free is also a critical economic issue. The Internet's, Internet's impact on global growth is rising rapidly. According to a study by McKinsey and Company, the Internet accounted for 21 percent of GDP growth over the last five years in developed countries. And data is now beginning to be compiled that illustrates that innovation and economic growth are related to the free flow of information. Finally, in answer to the question, why are we here, we are in a technological arms race. Yes. New tools emerge every day that help new voices to be heard, images to be seen, and changes to happen. But in those tools, there is also grave danger, a danger that many in this room know, a danger that repressive regimes may be using them to track down those who use them. Your mobile device may be your best friend, or it may be your worst enemy. So. This is some of what we'll be talking about over the next two days. Your job 
is to stand up and speak out, complain and be constructive, tell us when you're learning and when you're not. When you leave tomorrow afternoon, we hope you do so armed with new information, uh, better prepared for what's down the road this year and in the next few, and certainly more inspired. Now, in the spirit of involving you all from the start, I'd like to call on a few people in the audience, in this case I did warn them, to tell us in a single sentence why they're here and what they hope to learn. So perhaps I'll start with Sanjana from Sri Lanka. Where are you? So wait for a mic or do I just... The mic is right there. Um, I'm Sanjana Hattatu. I'm from Sri Lanka. I run a dissident citizen journalism site called groundviews.org, which is one of the country's most read alternative news sources. And I'm here because a lot of us in countries that are repressive seem to believe and very often are isolated from even the shared challenges of activists and citizen journalists in our own regions. So it's very interesting to come here and speak with a lot of you to find that the challenges we have at home aren't actually unique, are shared, and to also get a sense of solidarity. Thanks very much. Julie, where are you? Over there. The mic is coming. Hello, I'm Julie. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Cameroonian and I'm currently living in Paris. I am an author for Global Voices Online. <laughs> Hello, Ivan. And uh, I write on sub-Saharan African issues, mainly. And uh, I, uh, I'm pretty happy to be here to exchange uh, ideas and uh, share experiences on uh, how freedom of expression is, uh, is uh, dealt with in other parts of the world. And uh, I'm pr pretty happy to, to, to know that I'll be able to learn uh, on how I can uh, foster freedom of expression on my continent, which is Africa, and specifically in my country. So thank you for the invitation and looking forward to the exchanges. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Smari? Oh, there you are. Hi, uh, I'm Smari McCarthy from the International Modern Media Institute. Uh, I'm mostly here to try and figure out what the problems that we're faced with in the next uh, couple of years are shaped like so that we can try and raise the bar and figure out proper solutions to all of the problems. And so uh, both working from the bottom up and, and uh, every other angle. And finally, Lucy, where are you in the crowd? Right there. Thank you. I'm Lucy Morian with Reporters Without Borders, Reporters Sans Frontières. I'm really glad to be here today. I think it's going to be a, a wonderful time with a wonderful crowd. We look forward to uh, learning from each other. And as Bob was mentioning before, I think it's a very critical time for a free and open internet. And uh, we need to show solidarity. We need to work more together. We need to share experience. And that's what, what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Just to give you a taste of the people you're surrounded by here and their diverse backgrounds. Iceland, that's where Smari's from, even though he didn't say it. Uh, Cameroon, France, and Sri Lanka. Uh, now I'm going to turn to the first debate and introduce our moderator for that session. Susan Glasser is the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. She's an innovative and editor and reporter extraordinaire. She has done the impossible and made both the personal and professional transition from the so-called traditional media to the digital media. She has spearheaded her magazine's ambitious expansion in print and online at foreignpolicy.com. I will repeat that advertisement, foreignpolicy.com. During her tenure, the magazine has won three digital magazine awards and was recently honored for online general excellence by the Overseas Press Club. She joined foreign policy in 2008 after a distinguished tenure at the Washington Post. She spent four, four years as co-chief of their Moscow bureau, covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. We are pleased to have her preside over the opening debate. Join me in welcoming Susan and the participants in that debate.
Well, thank you so much, uh, first of all, to Bob while everyone is taking their seats. I uh, am very honored, of course, to be here. I can't promise you that I will moderate this conversation with the same uh, dry humor uh, as Bob brought to the introduction, but uh, I will try. And I, I'm particularly thrilled because I think we have a, a, a great group of uh, debaters for you today. And uh, I've been told I'm not allowed to take a vote at the end to see who won or not, but we are hoping and aiming to ch at least change some minds uh, this morning. So I hope uh, all of you will not only be engaged by the conversation, but participate. We'll, we'll make sure to get to your questions uh, at some point during this. So this is a, a formal debate that we have, and I think we have a pretty broad mission this morning in what we're going to be talking about. Um, just to lay out a little bit for you what the, what the parameters of the conversation are, think about this. According to the Open Net Initiative, more than 620 million internet users, that's 31 percent of the world's total, live in countries where there is a substantial or pervasive filtering of online content. Frankly, those numbers might even be low, right? Uh, we're all familiar, of course, with the worst offenders, dictatorships, and authoritarian regimes that essentially attempt to limit what people can say and what information they can access. But today, there's, of course, democratically uh, run countries around the world, including this one that struggle with these crucial questions about how to achieve the right balance between protecting individuals and their rights and protecting national security, social stability, cultural traditions. That's the subject of our debate writ large this morning, and it's a pretty broad one. Should laws and regulations that affect the internet favor the individual over the state? Thinking of that video that introduced things for us this morning, I was struck by one phrase. The challenge, says Google in the video, is to make sure that the internet remains free. Another question I think I'll be having for our panelists is whether the internet is in fact free, uh, even right now. If you remove the phrase, of course, that affects the internet, the conversation that we're having today is an age-old one. The line between the rights of citizens and the needs of the state is, in fact, at the heart of political debate uh, and has been as long as there's been a debate about political philosophy. But it's also the stuff of everyday dilemmas faced by all of us and certainly everyone in this room who comes here bringing a variety of engaged and activist perspectives to the conversation. The debate has never been more relevant. Right now, the internet reaches billions of people around the world. But it's not just governments and individuals who struggle with this. Companies, NGOs, as well as individuals and the people who are elected to lead them struggle with this. I can't imagine that we could have a better group of uh, four people to lead us through this debate. I'm hoping, uh, and perhaps you can help me in egging them on, uh, to make sure that they really engage in a clash of ideas this morning. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce quickly our panelists, uh, and then we'll jump right in uh, to the conversation. John Kampfner was a foreign correspondent and magazine editor for the last two decades. Until recently, he also served as the chief executive of the Index on Censorship. He's the author, most recently, of Freedom for Sale and is now an advisor to Google on free expression. His debate partner is Renata Avila, a human rights lawyer who leads Creative Commons in Guatemala. She co-heads as well the Technology for Transparency Initiative and, like one of our uh, speakers already. She's a contributing writer for the Global Voices Collective. On the other side, Stuart Baker was the first Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department for Homeland Security. He's also served as General Counsel of the National Security Agency. In other words, he's been in the middle of some of the toughest debates that there are about uh, internet security, privacy, and the like. Today, he's a partner in the Washington law firm of Steptoe and Johnson. His partner, is Numan Ferry, an elected member now of the Tunisian National Constitutional Assembly. Yes, that's the post-revolution Tunisian parliament. He is also an expert on information technology, and I think he'll bring us a valuable perspective of a society that's in transition on exactly these questions. For our format today, we'll let each of our panelists make a five-minute opening statement. I'll then ask them a few questions, and then we'll at let them ask questions of each other. In the last 30 minutes, we'll open it up to all of you. We're going to alternate our opening statements between the two tables, and we'll start with John Kempner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Good morning. Well, I, I have a win-win situation because either I get things going and stimulate debate, 
um, or you'll all think, well, things can only get better after my presentation. <laughs> so either way, um, it's great to be the first speaker at the first debate um, on the first morning of um, Internet at uh, Liberty. I, I don't have a prepared speech. I have some thoughts, and these are broader societal thoughts that play into the discussion of the Internet, and I hope by starting from a slightly more ethereal level, we can think a little bit more about um, people's um, priorities. There are, of course, no absolutes between liberty and security. This was the, the theme of, of, my, of my last book, Freedom for Sale. And my question that I asked all the way through is that why do people around the world, irrespective of the political hue, the political systems, or the cultures of the countries in which they live, why are people willing to trade security and the prospect of prosperity? Uh, why are they pre uh, prepared to uh, trade liberty for the prospect of security um, or um, uh, prosperity? And fundamentally, we need to understand what is going on when we look at uh, the internet, as, which is obviously on the front line of this debate with the competing rights of free expression, privacy, anonymity, security, and cultural um, norms. I just want to um, give a couple of uh, quotes, first of all, um, from the book, which I hope um, sets the perspective and then develop those thoughts. In order to succeed in the moral void post-1989, the new authorita authoritarians made a pact with their respective peoples. Although the precise rules vary from country to country, the template is always the same. Repression is selective. It is confined to those who openly challenge the status quo. After all, how many people really wish to rattle the cage? A distinction is created by clever authoritarians between public freedoms and private or privatized freedoms. Public freedom is the public space. It is the space that governments and states believe to be their own. Private space is the freedom to lead your life the way you wish to, the freedom to travel, the freedom to educate your kids the way you wish to, the freedom to wear the clothes that you wish, the freedom to lead your own private life. As long as the latter, the private freedoms are guaranteed, states feel more comfortable in accreting ever more power for the public space. And that is the clever lesson that 21st century authoritarian governments and many Western governments are learning from the mistakes of 20th century dictatorships by giving people private freedoms. One can more easily than one realize be lulled into thinking that one is sufficiently free. And that is the uncomfortable, that is in many ways the dark challenge that faces all of us here. Um, I led um, the UK's main free expression organization for four years, my journalism uh, as uh, bureau chief in Moscow in East Berlin when the wall came down has always been um, uh, driven by a uh, propulsion towards freedom to, and seeing people break down barriers. But all the way since 1989, what I call uh, a new phenomenon, which is consumerism as an anesthetic that dulls the political senses, has uh, grown. And for all the fantastic work that free expression groups, um, many of whom uh, at Index I have worked with over the last four years, um, do, there is an enormous societal challenge facing all of us, which is to ensure that public freedoms, the freedom to participate in the public realm, um, are valued at least as much as private freedoms that many people have taken from the internet. And it is those private freedoms that people are enjoying. And what is so important uh, for NGOs um, in this constant push-pull with authorities is to promote the right of people to be active in the public realm. Thank you very much, and on time, too. So we'll go to our next opening statement from Stuart Baker. Thanks, Susan. Uh, on behalf of the guys in ties, uh, please don't vote against us for that reason. Um, 
I think just looking at the question, we have to win. Because it, it, the, the question is, should laws and regulations that affect the internet favor the individual over the state? So the, the principle is always favor the individual over the state. You know, as Susan said, we've had this argument for hundreds of years, and you just imagine if the question were, should tax laws always favor the individual over the state? You'd say, well, I, no, I, I don't. Or how about reckless driving laws? Should they always favor the individual over the state? Again, you're not going to be comfortable with a question like that, because the answer can't be yes. And the same is true, I would suggest, when we come to laws that regulate the internet. Uh, should libel laws always favor the individual over the state? Now, now you don't even know whose side the individual is on. The state is enforcing rules about protecting the reputation of people online or off. Should child pornography laws always favor the individual over the state? Uh, again, uh, uh, you, you kind of say, you mean the defendant or you mean the kid? Uh, uh, and that is, at bottom, the tension that I see in this uh, uh, question. We have stated a principle which sounds pretty plausible until you start breaking it down to say, well, what does it really mean in specific cases? And I think one of the interesting questions is how we got to a place where this principle would sound plausible. And I would suggest that it is in part because we all celebrated as these old, clunky 20th century authoritarian states ran up against nimble, uh, uh, tech-adapted uh, dissenters who just took them down because they couldn't keep up. And it was, it was exciting. It was a thrill. It was a joy to watch. Um, and you know, I, uh, we can only hope that Bashir al-Assad al uh, meets the same fate. Uh, uh, but the fact is, people do things in revolutions. They come together and make self-sacrifices. They, they voluntarily organize in ways that don't make sense for a long-haul organization of society. And we're watching as the enthusiasm of revolution all across the Arab world turns into a little bit of doubt about exactly how to organize the society that has been freed from the authoritarians. Uh, uh, and that's the hard work. Uh, uh, and I would suggest that uh, uh, the real uh, fight is actually what John talked about. Uh, uh, the, 20 the 20th century authoritarians will fall. The effort to build quasi-totalitarian states will not succeed given the uh, strength of this technology. And the construction of soft authoritarian states, 21st century authoritarian states, is the struggle that we will all live with. But I would submit that we are not advancing our, uh, our goals here of fighting 21st century authoritarianism by trying to defend principles that, at the end of the day, are indefensible. There is no way to say the state should always lose when it tries to regulate the internet, uh, because sooner or later, in a properly organized society, the state is representing us, because who else will do it? This is how we make the rules that we want to be governed by. Uh, and when we make those rules, we ought to be able to enforce them. Uh, and instead of fighting the idea of enforcing rules, including regulating internet activity, we should be looking for ways to distinguish between the kinds of regulation that are offensive to democratic values and those that support democratic values. Thanks, Stuart. All right, Renata, your turn. Disagree with him, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, before I start my statement, I want to remind attendees that not far from here in Alexandria, a secret grand jury is investigating internet activists from at least four different countries in the world after the publication of inter on the internet of a video by WikiLeaks, which exposed serious human rights abuses and crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against children, crimes against journalists. And uh, the crimes exposed in the video remain in impunity, but at the very least, we know about it. Everyone in the world knows about it, and that's one of the virtues of the internet nowadays. So the internet has become a public, uh, public tool to, make, uh, to let us know about serious breaches to international humanitarian law, to let us know about corruption, about corrosion, about uh, bad governments or bad individuals doing bad things around the world. 
and national and regional security issues of the US and the European Union uh, are threatening, uh, are actually threatening fundamental rights of citizens outside the jurisdiction of US or EU. And uh, in countries like mine, which is a good example to make uh, my point, I, I will explain a little bit about the situation in my country. Um, in the 80s, Guatemala survived one of the most brutal armed conflicts, justified by the national security doctrine. Uh, to protect citizens, to protect us, the government surveilled, harassed, and disappeared up to 40,000 people. And communications were at the very core of the military strategy. They had the most advanced technology to do so at that time. The army will target you uh, by, the, by your readings. They will follow, follow you everywhere. If they will if, if they'll find a subversive book on your flat, then you will be killed or disappear. Um, belonging to a group or supporting a cause will be enough to kill you. Can you imagine such a scenario nowadays with all the tools governments have access to and all the tools that private companies provide? That is extremely important in the United States, where the most important companies controlling the key layers of the internet are based. Um, in Latin America nowadays, the region I come from, the, a region of democracy, uh, highly corrupt governments in bed with mafias and parallel powers, they have access to such technology. So uh, nowadays, the internet is the only tool left in many contexts. It's the only tool that uh, journalists who are all often silenced have to break the such silence. And anonymity is crucial in countries like Mexico, for example. It's the only protection an individual uh, or a group might have to organize, inform others, or expose crime and corruption. So my invitation here in this conference uh, to global citizens is to defend our right to know, our, our right to express ourselves in an anonymous way. It is part of our freedom of expression. Uh, our privacy and our future of, uh, as free human beings because we are heading towards a society of total control that is very similar to the totalitarian regime controlled by some powerful governments and powerful corporations who are totally ignoring human rights standards and who are totally uh, using the argument, oh, we want to protect our citizens, our citizens, not global citizens, to irrespect uh, rights of citizens outside the, the, the areas they want to protect. So uh, no one has, uh, another topic that I want, I want to raise quickly is the bad use of copyright laws to censor us and how it, it is not even justified, and it is uh, on national security, I mean, but it is used to prevent people from express themselves, and it is part of the national policy and the international policy of many countries. Thank you very much, Renata. Okay, so rounding up the uh, introductory statements is uh, Noman. Hi, so I'll give my part of this uh, Thai divide. <laughs> uh, uh, firstly, I'd like to say that I represent the people who elected me rather than the Tunisian uh, government. So I'm elected member of the of the uh, Tunisian Assembly. Uh, and I think the, the main question is, uh, the main uh, thing which we need to be careful with is government is not the state. And this question is there because a lot of people, a lot of people and a lot of uh, government, uh, they, they, they consider themselves as the representative, as the sole representative of the state. Therefore, and they put laws in favor in government rather than laws in favor of the states. That's the real question. Uh, I'll talk to you about Tunisia before the revolution, before 14th of January, where, frankly speaking, laws and practices were there to favor the government. Uh, my children didn't want to go back to Tunisia because there was no YouTube. Uh, and that became, that, that was, that's a real statement because the kids wanted to share information, to express themselves. They didn't have any problem to move back to Tunisia if they had a way to interact with uh, other people and, and who they shared the same experiences with. So, however, the, when Facebook was opened in Tunisia, which was 
roughly a couple of years before the revolutions. If Facebook was there, the revolution wouldn't have happened. Maybe not at that time. When we started to share information, when we started to look at each other, to, to receive real information about what's happening next door in the other town, and when we, we started to have to build a citizenship feeling that we have to do something about it, until the 14th of January, when naturally, without any, any, per, any person have organized it, 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 we all went into the street and we all demanded that the current regime, I will use a proper word, leaves. And, and, <laughs> and, the, the, uh, and then it happened. And that, uh, that was an incredible feeling that wouldn't happen if we didn't have a free internet, I say, relatively free internet. Then what happened after? After we had, uh, we had people who, who started to bombard each other with information, first the information was really reliable, and people were sharing information what's happening because time was, was really, in one day we were doing things which we wouldn't normally do in a month, and there's overload of information, and suddenly the information becomes unreliable. And that's the problem now. The information is unreliable. Before, the space of information was controlled by government. Now the space of information is controlled by a group of people who, who we, we cannot guarantee the reli reliability of information. And the space of information was guaranteed by lobbyists, by, by, lobbyist, by po political parties, etc. And that's where the result of that, that people will not go back to that place as a source of information. Uh, so w what we are trying to do is to, in the, as you know, we are, we are writing our constitution right now, and we, we would like, a lot of people, a lot of us, I hope that we will be the majority of us, would like to make sure that open gov principles uh, uh, should be in the constitution. We are, uh, we are trying to make sure that we have a, a constitutional commission for transparency to guarantee the right to access to the information. Um, to answer stri strictly the question, filtering, filtering information, no. We should not filter information, except in few cases, child pornography, as we mentioned, and others. Um, uh, monitoring the internet, no, except following somebody who is unlawful, known to be unlawful, and accessing individual information, absolutely not, except in, uh, in very few cases. And the, the difficulties, and to, what are these cases that we will need to access individual information? But let me remind you again, if, that the, uh, we didn't have access to free internet, uh, the Tunisian revolution may not be there, Gaddafi would have been maybe still in power, uh, the uh, Yemenit and the, with the Nobel Prize, the lady who owned the Nobel Prize would never been there maybe, and today, is, as we speak, we have an election in Egypt. And internet and free internet played a big role in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great opening statement. So now we move into the question round. Uh, I'm going to go back to each of our panelists. They'll have uh, four minutes to respond uh, to each question. So John, I'm going to go back to you since you let off. Uh, and here's my question for you. Not everybody on the internet is a good guy, right? Uh, and whether it is, you know, not everybody is a liberal revolutionary. Not everybody is a human rights activist. Uh, I want to probe a little bit. What is your sense of what limits, if any, are appropriate, given that? Uh, that, that that's a very good opening question. It allows, um, it allows me, I mean, um, just uh, by way of introduction, I mean, um, when Numan talks about um, information, the reliability of information, there are two words that always put a chill down my spine. Mm. One word is reliable. And the other word is responsible. Um, who is to determine notions of reliability and responsibility? And with all due respect, if it is politicians, governments, um, or other people um, in suits determining, um, and I'm in a suit. Um, with ties? Uh, <laughs> with, with, or without. with or without ties. Um, OK, the, dress code is outside code of is our out. uh, um, and, 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 speech and, rules. And then when he talked about um, uh, it's, it is legitimate to follow people who's, um, uh, who the state knows to be unlawful, 
again, that puts um, a chill down my spine. Now, any advocate of free expression knows the original um, shouting cry, uh, fire in a crowded room, um, get out. Now, you can say, well, as soon as you state that there are exceptions to the rule, then there are no absolutes, and therefore there are no principles. Everything is relative. Well, of course, everything is relative. Um, child pornography, um, the issue that while being absolutely crucial um, uh, in um, for any parent uh, or any, um, I almost said it myself, responsible citizen, um, is always thrown as one of the great um, catch-alls. Um, it is a catch-all. There is a bad, bad world out there. There are bad, bad people out there. And you should feel very, very scared. We had it, um, <laughs> we have had it here in this country with the panoply of uh, laws um, passed not just since 9-11, but prior to 9-11, whenever there are issues of a national emergency. In my country, the UK, we have had all series um, of laws, um, including um, perhaps the um, Western world's most um, hideously repressive libel laws um, that thankfully, um, uh, thanks to the lobbying that, that, that we were doing, um, the, uh, the government is, has, is introducing changes um, to that, but you have an absolute, you have official secrets laws, you have a whole panoply of legislation that is designed to militate against the free flow of, of information, and that was even before um, all the new filtering and surveillance issues. And I'm talking not about authoritarian states, I'm talking about Western democracy. Um, uh, my uh, fellow Googlers will, um, I think, uh, corroborate this fact that it is Germany that has more um, takedown notices uh, requirements than any other country. In the UK, 600 public bodies have 600 public bodies. I'm not just talking about the um, uh, domestic and international security services, have the right to snoop on your email traffic and your phone traffic for issues of irresponsibility that involve um, illegitimate getting rid of your waste to dog fouling on the street. Um, you have this sense of what, of notions of responsibility and notions of security. And just one um, uh, thought uh, for people to ponder, when can a state ever promise total security? Promise you that whatever happens, we will keep you safe. Once you go down that route, just as there are no absolutes in free expression, but there must always be a presumption towards First Amendment principles of free expression. And when you restrict those principles, you do that knowingly and almost apologetically for doing so, so the state can do what it can to preserve your security. But when it... Um, secures for or demands for itself, or when people, as is often the case, demand of it the right to be kept totally safe, whether it is CCTV cameras, whether it is the only way to keep you totally safe is to watch you all the time. It is to read all your email traffic, to read all your text traffic, because even if you are not doing something that is irresponsible or unreliable, you might inadvertently know somebody who is. So on this issue, of course, the internet is a reflection of broader society. There must always be a presumption towards the individual. And where the state seeks to limit that, whether it is through surveillance, or any other issue uh, relating to the internet, it must do so almost apologetically and in as narrow a set of parameters as it is possible to construct. Stuart, I'm not going to argue with you about the whole taxes thing. Uh, so let's just let's just leave that aside. I, I want to pick up actually on this point that that John has just made, and here's my question to you. Um, the United States and other Western governments, uh, do you view them as unequivocal uh, good guys when you're looking at prioritizing their roles uh, when it comes to uh, ensuring rights of minorities, for example, as you pointed out in your opening statement? What about uh, 
the ways in which the United States and other countries not only have imposed a degree of surveillance on their own citizens, John mentioned Germany, uh, what about the U.S. role and that of U.S. companies in supporting uh, authoritarian regimes that censor the Internet around the world? We mentioned Assad. Do you believe uh, that the United States uh, should be doing more to regulate and to stop that kind of behavior? So, um, you know, compared to what would be the, the, the fair uh, response, uh, uh, you show me a <clears throat> country that has a different approach to the Internet um, <clears throat> that is better, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like to hear the defense of them. But uh, in fact, uh, on the whole, I think this is not a technology issue. It's not a question of do you regulate the, the uh, technology and therefore you're evil, or do you not and therefore you're good? Everybody does, which suggests that maybe you can't really organize a human society without some regulation of what people are doing on the Internet, just as you can't run a society without regulating what people do on the street. Uh, I, and, uh, and to say, well, um, there ought to be a presumption against regulation, that's probably true. That's probably a, a, a reasonable response uh, to almost any uh, assertion of state power. Well, show us why the state needs this authority before you undertake it. But the fact is that that argument has made, been made to democratic populations around the world, and they have said, yeah, do that. Uh, on the question of, and, and the, the problem with that is that takes you back to talking about something other than technology policy. You can't say, I have a technological solution here, and the solution is to introduce this technology or to withhold another form of technology. That's simply not going to be a plausible response, and it's not going to get at the question of whether the, the rules are being set with the consent, by and large, of the governed or by a self-appointed elite uh, or authoritarian government. I'll give you <clears throat> one example that I'm quite familiar with, um, wiretaps. Uh, every s mobile switch sold around the world by every company comes with a wiretap feature built in so that the government can tap calls. Uh, it, it requires that they do it one at a time, uh, but every uh, switch of that kind can, can be wiretapped. Why? Not because Bashar al-Assad asked for it or uh, 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 the, uh, the Ayatollah asked for it, but because the FBI asked for it and German and uh, British interior ministries demanded that any uh, switches sold in their territory allow them to carry out wiretaps of criminals who otherwise were going to be very early adapters. Uh, and they, they did do that. Once they did it, it became available to everybody. Uh, the idea that you're going to then say to uh, uh, Assad, well, you can't have that, uh, it, it is implausible both because the technology has already been built and because Assad can say, as the FBI can say, we have crooks too. You may not like what we do with all of this, but you can't determine what we do with it by setting a technology policy. This is much more fine-grained and much more about governance than about the technology. Renata, you mentioned WikiLeaks. Not everybody who uses the Internet uh, will use it in the same way that WikiLeaks does. What about Al-Qaeda, for example, which has the tools uh, that WikiLeaks has to uh, not only disrupt and to use uh, information in a way to support their cause, uh, but also to do so in a way that may support terrorism? Do you believe there's an absolute right for groups like Al-Qaeda to freely and openly use the tools of the Internet in the same way uh, that you or I might have? Uh, well, uh, I think that <clears throat> any 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 use of the internet should be uh, governed by international principles, human rights, international human rights standards, and that um, I'm, I'm I'm quite concerned about the this um, terrorism label. And uh, okay, in the case of Al Qaeda, is undeniable, but. Uh, the the use of the terrorism laws to suppress dissent, and um, I think that um, uh, the this preemptive censorship uh, is dangerous. I mean, um, this uh, well, 
uh, I was recently uh, reading a case of someone who was researching some topics and was an academic and was surveilled because of the kind of topics he was researching uh, because of the terrorism laws. So I think that we should agree as a community on a set of principles that all governments should stick to and that, uh, I mean, a, a national uh, problem with security shouldn't uh, ban citizens from the internet. And of course, uh, uh, I, I am totally against uh, uh, prior censorship because I, 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 I think that it is better to know what they are doing, what they are discussing, and what uh, is going on uh, open to the public eye and open. The more people who can read and access such information, the more people who can raise the alerts. If, uh, if, we, if you ban uh, groups that, like Al Qaeda from the internet, what will happen? I mean, uh, they will still communicate with each other, but they will do it in absolute obscurity. So you will not, you will not know anything. I mean, you will not have the possibility to uh, see their, their points and, uh, and to um, analyze their movements. So, Nirwan, in Tunisia, before the revolution, the Ben Ali regime, as you mentioned, was, was really a leader, if you can call it that, in uh, censoring the internet and really making uh, an extreme case of restricting people's individual rights. Uh, since the revolution, there have been new calls by different groups of people uh, to protect for example, uh, what they call cultural norms or traditional norms. Uh, you see Islamist groups today, for example, saying there should be more uh, regulation of the internet in Tunisia, uh, reflecting a new and different kind of uh, democratic government uh, in the country. How do you balance that? You know, is it, is it only uh, wrong to censor the internet when you disagree with the regime? And as you are drawing the Constitution, uh, do you believe that the First Amendment is a model that would apply uh, to your country and to others, or is that something that exists only uh, in the context here of, of Western political freedoms? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, first, I need to do three, three remarks. The first one, I'd like to thank John for agreeing with me on the fact that we need to narrow to narrow the sphere where to access information of people as uh, as narrow as possible. So that's uh, I think that's a point of agreement not rather than you, disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> the the we'll second the second thing is the the notion of good and bad. I think this notion of good and bad is a religious uh, notion, and I come from a secular party. Therefore, uh, I, I it's not up to the government or to the to say this, these guys are good, these guys are bad. It's up to the uh, individual when they interact with them to to say, sh do I like to interact with these people or I don't like to interact with these people. It has nothing to do with absolute value. These go these are good. These are bad. People are people. The third, the third remark is the uh, Arab democracy, and you cannot imagine how proud I am when I say Arab democracies, uh, is, is maybe will be slightly different from the Western democracies. Maybe they obey to 80% of the rule, but not 100% of the rules. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean that, um, uh, that they are not democracies. Uh, so to come back to the question of how do we deal with the religious people saying that, uh, that we need to censor the internet because of our religious, our religious um, our religious beliefs, yes, or uh, culture, cultural norms, or or, or cultural or cultural norm. Uh, I, I want to tell you that they lost the case in law. We, they, they, there was a case by the government to censor the internet, and they went to the tribunal in Tunisia, and they lost. And internet in Tunisia right now is still free. And it's up to you and me and other people to make sure that it continues to be free with the norms that we will agree on. Now, the question is which norm we agree on. Should we, should we, um, prevail, should we prevail the, um, the interest of the, uh, should we define the rules by having the majority of the people decide on the rules or each individual can keep it's freedom to do whatever he wants without without bothering the others. And that equilibrium, I must admit, is not found yet. 
uh, it will be it will be uh, we have another six months to 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 debate it i hope and uh, but one thing is sure that transparency and civil society involvement and the right to protect the people we disagree with are the way to go my role is to protect if i was in government is to protect the people i personally disagree with and if we reach that state of discussion then we can move forward the the and we will we will go uh, we will be away from the previous uh, regime not sure if i answered all your questions but the first amendment yes or no uh, applies to tunisia do you think is as a model the first amendment the united states first amendment is that a good model for your new constitution uh, i i Honestly, I wouldn't know exactly what is the First Amendment, if you apologize for that, uh, if you can be more... It, it's very simple. Congress shall make no law abridging uh, the freedom of speech and expression in the Absolutely. United States. Absolutely. Absolutely applies. All right, I'm going to quick point of uh, personal uh, I answer. Just, I, I just wanted to come back uh, on um, uh, something that, um, that Stuart said. When... Um, <laughs> Absolutely right that when uh, the mobile technology being uh, used, uh, whether it's uh, in Syria or elsewhere, uh, it has been installed at the request of Western governments. Uh, now, you look at leaving aside the rights and the wrongs of the WikiLeaks case, and, and one could argue that in great detail for a very m a long uh, amount of time. The um, somewhat uh, hysterical response of the Justice Department when the um, uh, fracas um, uh, was at its peak, was manna from heaven for Putin, for the Chinese, for uh, any repressive governments in the Middle East or elsewhere. They're simple. It, was, it gave them, um, as did David Cameron's initial response to the riots last August in the UK. His initial response was, how did they happen? Oh, Prime Minister, it was Blackberry Instant Messenger. Well, close it down. And as soon, and of course, that, and then the Foreign Office said to him, well, actually, that would make the propagation of our foreign policy, encouraging open information, encouraging instant communication with people, a little bit more difficult to sustain. Whenever Western governments reach for the security agenda above all else, whether it is legitimate in, in, in individual cases or not, it gives a wonderful get-out clause for authoritarian leaders to harbor on. It may be entirely illegitimate, but they use the perception of moral equivalence to pursue their own agendas. And that is just something policymakers here and in other Western governments should be more conscious of than they currently are. Okay. All right. So we're in the asking questions of each other phase. Uh, you've already sort of had half of one here, John. Uh, but so, Renata, why don't you jump in and you can ask either one of your colleagues. Uh, um, yes. Well, um, I was very interested, interested in this uh, surveillance by design included in any and every mobile phone, tracking everyone and uh, putting in danger uh, everyone uh, or maybe saving from the bad guys, criminals. So. I, I was wondering if the um, Tunisian government uh, is um, thinking about uh, adopting the opposite, um, a model of privacy by design instead of uh, surveillance by design, like sticking to the, and protecting the privacy and with it the security of citizens or not? So, may I? Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, again, I'm I'm from the opposition. I'm not from the government. However, what we what we um, uh, what we all agree, at least most of us, I think, agree on that uh, access to information, a freedom of expression, is the norm. Uh, um, transparency is the norm. Uh, even in our debates inside the constitution, we we insisted that it's a hundred percent. Um, 100% uh, transparent, uh, access to the media, etc. With the exception, uh, and the exception is, we if there is a reason why we should do it privately, we decide on it together. So, so the the freedom is the norm. Uh, access to the information by the government will not be the rule. Definitely will not be the rule. Am I answered your question, or I answered a different question? 
I was more concerned about privacy of the of the citizens because too often governments uh, now are because it's so easy to uh, monitor citizens. Mm. Uh, uh, there are, there are uh, like uh, implementing not only this, uh, deploying technology but implementing laws that allow them that they give a. Uh, uh, Basically, you're asking if there's going to be a law to protect citizens' right of privacy as well as their yeah. right of speech. And mechanisms to, uh, I, to monitor the, those watching citizens. Yeah. I, I hope so. Uh, I hope so, and we'll, 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 we'll fight for it. However, we need to be very careful. For example, I tell you the French does not give the electoral role to political party to do advertising or the 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 uh, in UK they give the electoral role uh, the list of people who are to to a political party to use them so so which way would should we and both are democracies uh, which way which way to go should we forbid the uh, the uh, the small parties to get access to the electoral role therefore we favor the big parties who have more access or should we not? So the problem, uh, the, the, it's quite a difficult question, but definitely the, the privacy is the norm. However, there are, there are something to make sure to protect the, we need to protect the right of, um, of minorities. And to do that, maybe we need to give access to people to some of the information to use them to promote democracy. Stuart, yes. question for your opponents. Okay, um, John, uh, suppose I uh, took to heart your, your suggestion that uh, reliability and responsibility shouldn't be the province of government. And I said, uh, but we surely have to have reliable statements, res responsible people, and action online. And I've got this brilliant idea for crowdsourcing it. Uh, that is to say, everybody will get a reputation for telling the truth or not telling the truth. They'll be held responsible for the things they say and do online. Only one thing we have to do, get rid of anonymity. Where do you come out? How, how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna maintain responsibility for behavior without holding people in the real world responsible for what they've done online? Um. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you've had a crowdsourced response. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not Next known question. for my brevity, but I think that's probably <laughs> an answer. John, it's your turn to ask a question. Um, right. Um, when. Um, okay. So on on uh, when uh, Norman, you were talking about. 80%. Now, this, this issue of, I think, giving percentages to levels of democracy, whatever, I, I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily effective uh, to go down that. But the issue of um, I, cultural specificity, which I think you were alluding to, is a, is a very interesting one. Um, I res in in, in uh, researching my last book, I spent a lot of time in, in the country of my birth, Singapore, um, and it has always been Lee Kuan Yew's contention that in order to uh, preserve the social fabric of an inter-ethnic um, society um, and stability um, and wealth, uh, highest per capita GDP in the world, certainly was at the time, um, you need this sense of uh, societal restraint and responsibility, otherwise known as a lack of free expression. Um, um, but being... Um, it is an absolutely. Uh, it, it is a. It is an important point, and it's. It's more an invitation for you to flesh out um, what it is. I mean, I uh, look this issue of of in, in in a different geographical context. Asian values is is uh, an intensely interesting one. I also think it's an entirely spurious one as well. Um, this every country, every region, every continent, every part of every country has its own specificities. Uh, communities have their own sensitivities and they're entirely right to have them. Are you saying that free expression should be curtailed um, over and above existing standards and existing generic laws um, in order to cater to these uh, real or perceived uh, sensitivities? Absolutely not. Freedom of expression has to be guaranteed by by constitution, by law, by activism, by everything. Freedom of expression 
is the only way to guarantee to guarantee an equilibrium. Uh, however, uh, regarding the question of of um, cultural cultural specificities, uh, I know that that argument was used by Singaporean government to maintain an, author an authoritarian regime. Uh, then people will ask themselves, and I know the argument, uh, having uh, read some some books uh, about it and having lived in Singapore for a year, uh, did did the Singaporean government achieve what the people of Singapore wanted to achieve uh, in, a, in a good sense? Uh, probably in a lot of cases. Uh, could uh, did they reach a level of where freedom of expression needs to be needs to be much better than it is? Absolutely yes. And the to to be back to the question, the, I do not know the answer of what are the specific uh, cult cultural specificities that we will have in our democracies because we are in a journey that we just started and we are looking for it. We need to find the equilibrium that maintain maintain the maintain the 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 not only the social stability but the moving moving forward of of, of the people uh, i uh, the answer is i don't know but we will discover together with our opponents our opponents and the country are from the are from more from the singaporean trend if you like or even more i am more from the western trend but i know that the end the the, the end result is somewhere in between that we don't know what it is yet but if it is different from the Western democracy, so be it. It's not, it is not an issue as long as the end game is to serve the need of the people. And here I need to add one sentence. It's not about culture only, it's about education. When we reach a level of education of, of one country, naturally the culture becomes very open, therefore you accept every a lot of different culture. When the level of education is low, you tend to to, to, to be protective of your own culture. So our only way is to keep banging on helping education, people to get educated to reach that level that I do not know what it is yet, that, that equilibrium. Uh, we don't know. Yeah, thank Good you. One. It's your turn as well to uh, ask a question of your colleagues. Uh, so uh, our, uh, ask our uh, question to you in, in return now. Uh, the, the, in, in which cases you see that we need to access information, that the governments need to access individual information? Which strict cases we need? Do, do, do you, does the government have the right to access it? And in, if so, in which specific cases? I, I think that the access to information of citizens uh, should be uh, the exception and not the general rule. Uh, if uh, information of a citizen is required uh, to uh, perform a public activity, uh, um, then it is valid. For example, I need uh, to have a, a number to get health care, but I do not need my government to have complete and uh, absolute access and, and make public my uh, health records, for example. Uh, I, I am very worried about this because uh, Countries are, uh, for example, in Latin America, in many countries of the world, and citizens on, in my side of the world, they don't know that in many countries they don't even have a, an ID card, or they have an ID card with minimum data okay. on it. Uh, in uh, the trend in Latin America is to go more and more and more to get more uh, information about the citizens, from fingerprints to the iris to the uh, biomet all the biometric information possible. And this information goes to hands that are not exactly reliable. You have the experience. Now you have a, a democracy and a good government you don't know in the future. Mm. So uh, every time that I give away my data, I don't know uh, the, the hands uh, uh, this information will uh, be into. Mm -hmm. And information is such a powerful weapon, I mean. It's such a, it's such a, in the wrong hands, I, I, uh, now there are even uh, systems who can track my face if I am at demonstration, for example. Uh, my anonymity that I want to keep, it is, it is uh, not possible anymore. And one more thing, it is not only my government holding my information, they like to share. <laughs> they love to share, it's very different, uh, they have the, 
uh, war against sharing uh, of citizens sharing information uh, with each other. They put barriers, co copyrights, and blah, blah, blah. But they, they love to share information about us. And we don't even know who they share the information with. Yeah. Like every time that we visit a country and that we put the fingerprints and the camera, uh, then immediately, or every time that we pay with a credit card, or every time that we check in in an hotel, all this information goes to to same pool. And governments who are, uh, which I do not necessarily agree with, or who I don't even know, uh, are have complete access to my data. And we don't have mechanisms to, to protect ourselves. So the less we give away, the more that we can preserve our sphere of privacy. Well, it is amazing how much our conversation converges these two uh, debates about speech and privacy often uh, end up as one discussion. Renata, we're going to do a final lightning round of questions uh, among the panelists, and then we'll get to the questions of the audience. So you have a question for Stuart. Um, yes, I have a question. Mm. Yeah, so uh, too often the, the national security issue is raised, and uh, um, yes, national security for the citizens within one state without considering the security of citizens abroad. I, um, I would like to know uh, how can we move towards a, an international standard to protect the, the security and while respecting the rights of a global village, a global world. So how can we all agree as community uh, uh, without sacrifice, sacrificing the rights of some country to protect the rights of other country? So I, I wish there were an easy answer to that. I don't think there is an easy answer to that. We are slowly seeing the emergence of some norms. Um, a, Companies that provide webmail services insist on seeing court orders and providing information in response to uh, particular crimes. Uh, in some cases, they store their data in countries that are particularly demanding about the uh, kinds of crimes that can be investigated. And, and that is slowly building a kind of international understanding about when you can and cannot get access to certain kinds of information. Um, but, you know, we're going to run into the problem I described earlier. Uh, everybody has criminals. Everybody has a legitimate basis for arguing that they have a security-based reason to monitor certain kinds of uh, communications. And it's very difficult, uh, certainly for private actors, to say, oh, no, you, you, you have no legitimate basis for doing that. Uh, and so as soon as you set a ground level for security, you're going to have abuses. Um. Okay, no, you know, we're going to run out of time to get to our audience, so I want to encourage everybody to give short answers. Stuart, you have one final question to the other side. Okay, so for, for Renata, I, uh, and I'll come back to uh, uh, probably imprudently uh, uh, anonymity. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you were enthusiastic about WikiLeaks as a human rights uh, issue. Some of the people who, whose information was disclosed had been promised by the United States government that they would be protected from their government when they came into dissent from what their government was doing or to provide in information about what their government uh, activities were, were, were. Some of them were farmers who were reporting on the Taliban's <laughs> activity in their village. Uh, um, so is it that their anonymity is not worth anything? What's the, what's the human rights well, side of this issue? Yeah, that's a very good question to ask the government of the United States in the first place. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm sorry. Julian Assange published it. The United States government did not. Well, Julian, is Julian Assange a, a uh, human rights hero, or is he an anonymity-busting bad guy? I will go back to guy? your original question that was, OK, uh, I think that the responsibility was on the government, these people that went to the embassies, uh, trust, and uh, the fact that it was a huge security breach on a system, and the fact that this information was already uh, shared with more than four million people. I mean, information shared with four million people, how, what is the reasonable, reasonable level of privacy that you can expect. I mean, I don't know if these people that went to embassies were informed that the information that were, they were providing to an ambassador or to a secretary was shared with four million people. I mean, uh, I think that that's uh, the confidential information, the duty to protect 
is in the government and not, not on citizens uh, making uh, publicly uh, available if the government was not careful enough. Okay, good question, good answer. John, final question. Uh, just one little, um, if I uh, could be permitted, one little cheap shot, and then one one question. Um, <laughs> can you can uh, you form it? Can you Stuart, do it in the form of I'll, a question? I'll try. I'll try and do both <laughs> in the same question. Um, Stuart, uh, you're, when you say every state has legitimate right to go after criminals, that's what the Russians said when they went. The Soviets said when they went after Andrei Sakharov. That's what the Chinese say when they go after Ai Weiwei. Under their uh, criminal codes, they were, and and if if it is through the definition of a criminal code and a legit a state precisely view. why this is a hard problem not an easy one not okay. not resolvable by first principles okay my my, my actual Wait. question um goes around on the issue of transparency uh as maybe an interim measure to um build confidence in the benign nature of the accretion of information by um by the state i put benign in very commas um uh, five european countries are in the process of developing transparency reports, uh, obviously not naming names and not giving away information they wouldn't want to give, but about the levels of surveillance, the amount of surveillance, whether it is um, mobile uh, surveillance, email surveillance, whatever, raw numbers, um, everything else. Uh, would you recommend uh, the United States joining uh, that course of action? The U.S. does disclose a fair amount of information about its wiretaps uh, by law. Uh, there's a report that they have to do. Uh, I, I, I've never thought it was all that useful. It's, it's very hard to get deep into these things without getting into uh, information that shouldn't be disclosed to the targets of the, uh, uh, of the intercepts. Uh, but uh, there's nothing wrong with discussing this. Uh, Google has actually probably the best uh, uh, set of data on uh, national practices in this regard. And my guess is uh, uh, wherever the U.S. came up on this, that standard, it would be one-tenth the level of Italy. Okay, final question, and then we'll so, get to the audience. So really, the question, if government does not go after criminal, who does? Uh, absolutely. One, man's, uh, one government's criminal is another government's freedom fighter. Okay. <laughs> Good. On that note, I know there's a lot of questions in the audience. Please give us your name, tell us where you're from, uh, and try to make it a question uh, as well as a statement. Um, hello, um, Tom Risen with the New America Foundation. This is for uh, Numani and for Mr. Baker. Uh, first of all, Numani, congratulations on your work in Thank Tunisia. You. Thank you. Uh, you're, you said that your government would not surveil its citizens unless they were known to be criminal. Um, I would like you and Mr. Baker to talk about the definitions of data collection because the Utah Data Center, correct me if I'm wrong, is collecting data on U.S. citizens that have no criminal record. Um, how are you going to define who is known to be criminal? And uh, I would like Mr. Baker to comment on that practice by the NSA. Yeah, you're wrong. Um, you asked me to correct you if you're wrong. I, I, <laughs> That, that article was one of the weirdest that Jim Bamford has ever produced and full of kind of uh, innuendo rather than facts. Uh, what he knows is that it's a big uh, data storage uh, facility and he intuits that somehow it must be about us. Uh, uh, and there's really uh, not much evidence of that. Uh, uh, it is important to save data. I mean, everybody is saving data. Big data is where we're going. Uh, and it has helped us to catch terrorists in the past, and it will help us in the future. Uh, so being able to sift through large amounts of data to find patterns of behavior that alert us to terrorist activity is part of what we're going to end up having to do. Did you want to answer? Yeah, w very quickly. Uh, uh, I, I have no problem for collecting data. My problem is who access it and in which condition we access it. And that's the, the question, the hard bit. And that's the where we need to be extremely, extremely vigilant who and how you access these data. But accessing data for research, for hundreds of things, uh, needs to you need to put the, the, the right level of anonymity, if you like, on it to do to use it for research and statistics, etc. But to use it for government issue, again, we need to be extremely, extremely strict. And there will be there should be a constitutional commission outside the government 
who observe and monitor the behavior of any government, how he access that data. That's what we are aiming to do, <laughs> that it is not the case now, because we are writing the Constitution as we speak. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Questions? Uh, hi, I'm Mary Joyce from the Meta Activism Project, and I'd like to propose a standard for legislating the internet in democracies. And then, if you, it's short, and agree and disagree. Uh, the digital medium should not be used as a legislative opportunity to roll back civil rights protections of the analog era. Okay, so particularly privacy protections, due process, for example, SOPA, PIPA, and CISPA, which I would say are rolling back civil rights protections. Um, first of all, do you think that's legitimate, that we can um, roll back civil rights protections in the digital era? Um, legislatively, rather than through technology design. And um, so, yeah, that's my question. Our f we're quite a ways in before our first reference to SOPA. So, Stuart, do you have a response? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that I threw the first stone in the avalanche that, that took SOPA out. Uh, and I objected to it on the grounds that it was going to break DNSSEC. It was inconsistent with DNSSEC, which it was important to securing communications on the internet, which is the real civil rights, human rights crisis that we face. I mean, we've got authoritarian governments in our computers, watching us at our computers, listening to us, turning on our mics and our cameras, and recording our keystrokes. And, you know, the privacy guys keep thinking that the, the, the threat is somehow ar arising from efforts to control uh, break-ins to computers. Uh, I, but I did fight uh, SOPA and uh, take it out, uh, or at least it got taken out. I, it was sort of like uh, a villager th who threw a stone from a mountainside and the, uh, the column of tanks stopped because of the stone and then an avalanche took them out. But uh, I, it, was a, it was a dumb law, and it was a bad law, and I'm glad it's dead. Uh, I don't agree about CISPA. What CISPA does is undoes two kind of dumb uh, privacy rules that have turned out to be bad for security. These are rules that said essentially that uh, you can't share information if you're an ISP or a web mail provider about your customers to the government without a subpoena. Uh, you, you might say, well, that sounds reasonable. It did sound reasonable when the law was passed, but it turns out that many of the people who are sending us malware and using that to infect our computers and attack us our customers of the webmail providers, of the ISPs, they are customers. You can't share that information unless you determine individually, oh, there's a crime, let's give you a subpoena. Instead, what we should be doing is sharing that information as soon as we know there's a bad webmail address, sending malware. Everybody who uh, does not want to receive malware should get the word and be able to put up barriers to receiving that email. Uh, uh, that's the only way you're going to keep that malware from being opened on your systems. And if you can't share that information because of a dumb law from the 80s, we ought to get rid of the dumb law from the 80s. Any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I totally agree with, with um, Mary Joyce. Uh, but I will also add something. Uh, it is not only about local legislation, but uh, actually uh, I think that countries should commit not to export bad laws. And the uh, free trade agreements now uh, being negotiated around the world are exporting uh, CISPA plus <laughs> models, uh, like really uh, pushing um, um, tiny governments in areas of free trade uh, to uh, implement locally laws that will be very bad for their citizens. So mm -hmm. I would like to add. All right, okay. questions? Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. Okay. My name is Mohammed Al Abdullah. I'm a Syrian activist from the Syrian Center for Political and Strategic Studies. My question is Is the internet really governable? Could anybody regulate the internet? Because, in general, what Mubarak did and what Bashar al Assad did in Syria, shutting down the internet, pushing people to rely on satellite internet, they don't go through the ISPs in Syria. And that's another evidence. Nobody can regulate the internet. And if you want to elaborate a little bit in the lady's comment about the terrorism definition, it's clear with Al-Qaeda. But some cases, there are what you consider or the US consider a terrorism. It's not, which is the case of lots of Palestinian groups, for example. And let me give another example about Google today. And for, for example, due to US regulations and sanctions in Syria, some of Google products are not available for download for good users in Syria. And today's in Google. Uh, a blog today is saying, and today we are pleased to make Google Earth, Picasa, and Chrome available for download in Syria. As a U.S. company, we remain committed 
to full compliance with the U.S. export controls and sanctions. What is your opinion when there's cases where a good companies like Google, complying with a good governments, if I may consider the U.S. one of those, <laughs> and damaging and affecting good activists who's benefiting for and fighting for freedom of expression and human rights? Thank you. I. Yeah, let's 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 let that I, I, I Everybody's that. against Stuart on this one. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, the sanction regimes and the export control regimes are all administered through a system of licenses. The United States government can license Google uh, to to sell their products uh, if they think that the, that is going to have a beneficial effect for the people of Syria. Uh, you got to remember that Google Earth uh, it could be of immense value to people you wouldn't be quite as enthusiastic about using it uh, in Syria, uh, and so it's a hard question. But for sure, we should be uh, uh, we should we should uh, license the use of say Google Gmail uh, in Syria. Any response? Anyone else? Okay. Uh, just one. I, I, I recommend to Google not to comply with this. Um, okay. Uh, Renata? I think that what you said is very important, uh, and I will quote an example. Uh, this terrorism label to shut down networks is so tempting for governments. For example, in Panama, there were some demonstrations of indigenous, uh, uh, an indigenous community, and they were fighting for their rights. Uh, they were publicly demonstrating uh, against the government. And what the government did was to shut down the mobile network uh, because they, uh, they uh, quickly, without the trial, without anything, they said that they were terrorists and that they were uh, uh, causing insta instability in Panama and that, that they should, that should stop. And by, uh, that's, that's a, yet another uh, network to look at it in this conference because, for example, most of the people in, in Latin America, they access the, the internet via mobile phones and that's the way to create networks and to communicate. What the result of that was that the community, they, could, they couldn't organize. They were without uh, mobile service for 14 hours and the government uh, achieved their objective, the objective of censorship, of restricting the right of organization and the restricting the freedom of expression of this. Community. Okay, we have a long line of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Be brief. All right. My name is João Caribe. I'm from Brazil. I'm representing the Megano movement to guarantee the internet free. My question is based on a study for the German parliament, which determined that data retention could be not effective to seek the criminals. Uh, based on this, we need to know the, uh, the tired and the tired position about this issue. And uh, let me show a short case that occurred at Brazil. Two guys developed, the, I, now I know that was two guys, <laughs> maintaining the website with all kind of criminal issues, racism, uh, uh, pedophily, <laughs> and other authority cases related to this. These guys used any kind of anonymizer to keep it, their identity secret. But two guys forget one interesting issue on the internet, the six degree theory. We work, developed for ourselves one kind of a crowdsourcing investigation that found two guys, that two guys were now jailed, uh, arrested, uh, the crime was solved without any kind of data retention. What you can say about that? Okay, good question. So the, so the data retention debate is an interesting one. It's really a, a European debate more than an American debate. We, we've never had data retention, uh, and uh, uh, we probably won't, uh, whereas Europe adopted it after 9-11. Uh, uh, it's you know, I, one of the themes of my blog is that there are privacy victims all over the world because of the unintended consequences of privacy laws. Data retention is an unintended consequence of privacy laws because <coughs> only in Europe, under European laws, is it necessary to destroy data the minute you're done with it economically. You have no further use for this data for your own business. You have to get rid of it right now. 
Uh, and you can't keep it for 30 days, even though you know predictably that that's about when the police will realize that there's a, a, a pedophilia uh, site operating uh, uh, in this location, and you won't be able to uh, uh, identify the users without keeping the data for 30 days. In the U.S., it's much less uh, demanding in terms of getting rid of the data, and therefore there isn't the need to mandate massive uh, storage of data as the Europeans do. Mm -hmm. Now, Stuart, just quickly, I think he was asking uh, they could solve this crime uh, through other methods and didn't need data in order to. That often happens. Crack the yes, case. It, o it often happens. Uh, I mean, data retention makes it easier. It doesn't guarantee you're going to uh, uh, solve the crime, uh, uh, and it isn't always necessary. Uh, and in my view, increasingly, it's going to get harder and harder to disguise your identity uh, because the data is just stored everywhere uh, and ma in massive amounts. Uh, uh, and we can use that in place of data retention as long as we don't have a bunch of data protection authorities running around saying, uh, you've been, you haven't used that data for five minutes, you've got to get rid of it. Uh, if we leave a little bit more discretion to the people who hold that data, they'll be able to respond appropriately to law enforcement requests. Let's hope. Uh, hello, I'm Smar McCarthy from the International Modern Media Institute. Uh, so this debate, as many others of its type, has devolved into the question of uh, personal freedoms versus national security. So I have a question for Stuart Baker. Um, so, um, <laughs> I'm going to prioritize as the next question anyone who has a question not for Stuart Baker. All right. Okay. So, uh, as somebody who, during this debate, has uh, used inter uh, U.S. internal law enforcement policy as a way of justifying the uh, activities of the Assad regime, and as somebody who has uh, uh, pr suggested that we totally reject all anonymity except for Afghan farmers, I would like to hear uh, whether you have any make any distinction between the security of the state as an institution and the security of the people living in the state and what that distinction is. And I'd also like to know if others in the panel have uh, a distinction on that. Thanks. Yeah, I, 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 will, I will start by saying you've obviously misrepresented my views, but I think everybody got that. Uh, um, is there a difference between, yeah, at the end of the day, government has to be protecting people. The, the, the government protecting itself is, you know, fundamentally uh, inconsistent with democratic values. Uh, you can't protect yourself from the people, or you shouldn't protect yourself from the people who vote you in. Uh, there may be, it may be necessary to protect uh, the confidentiality of information for the government to function effectively uh, in certain circumstances, but uh, the idea that the state has some independent uh, justification uh, from the value that they provide to the people they serve uh, uh, to confidentiality strikes me as odd. Okay, was there any other uh, thoughts on the panel? Uh, well, I, I was just thinking on, on the previous um, uh, question, the issue of data, data retention, just coming back to that. Of course, you could devise a system where there is complete data retention for as long as there is capacity uh, for perpetual data retention. You could throw into that uh, telephonic um, audio data retention, CCTV video retention, and DNA database retention. Throw them all into the pot, and yes, I guarantee you'll have a far more um, secure state, and some really, really bad criminals who otherwise might not have been caught will be caught. If that's the price people wish to pay for better security, then, um, then that's a, um, a, a, a legitimate um, point of view. It's just not one that um, I would share. All right, so do we have a question not for Stuart Baker? I'm sorry, but my question is for Stuart Baker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're next in line, so I'll, I'll let you do it. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nadim Kobesi. I'm from CryptoCat. Um, my question, just a second. My question is concerning uh, what Mr. Baker said, well, what his group has been discussing concerning the domestic regulation of the internet. And my concern is that the domestic regulation of the internet inevitably will increase uh, the quickly already increasing uh, politicization of the internet on a global international level, even when you only regulate it domestically. And examples like this already exist both in the private and in the public sector. In the private sector, you have companies like Blue Coat, which are selling the Assad regime uh, you know, machines that allow him to monitor uh, his own uh, you know, people for nefarious ends. And also, um, you have uh, policies uh, in, you know, and, and, you know, government initiatives uh, that also promote internet freedom abroad, but also they promote internet freedom abroad where it might be disadvantageous 
to regimes that the United States government deems to be uh, against its foreign interests, which is fine. But uh, these are examples in which the internet is becoming more and more politicized. And if you uh, start um, thinking that it's a great idea to regulate the internet on a domestic level, then this will just snowball into uh, every government having a fuller control over its internet and then it becoming a more uh, an, 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 an area of more politicization where, gov where governments can just sort of have this sort of uh, uh, try to keep this upper hand on each other on uh, having the internet as a playing card even, uh, more of a playing card in uh, foreign uh, discussions with each other as, as nations. So what do you think about that? Is that a danger? Is that something that yeah, you I think, think? Yeah, I think uh, welcome to the 21st century is what I would say. The, yeah, this is where we're going. Uh, um, you know, when you when you build something that becomes part of the lives of everybody in Italy, uh, they expect it to be Italian. They expect it to reflect Italian values, to, to, to be part of Italian life, and including Italian political life. And uh, the idea that you can somehow say, oh no, I never meant to let you uh, have views on this technology gift that I gave you, you just have to take it, is unrealistic. We're, uh, this is inherently political, just as all human life is, is inherently subject to politics. Uh, and uh, the notion that somehow the technology can rise above it and, and wipe out the politics, I, I just think is not realistic. We're, we are in a world where politics, including international diplomacy, are going to drive a lot of things that happen on the internet. Uh, and resistance to that at a level of principle is, uh, is hopeless. Okay, we have time for one more question, right here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm Lasse Karkkainen uh, from uh, the part party of Finland. Um, my question is, uh, well, there are really different aspects that have been, we have been speaking of. Uh, one is the privacy, whether you can communicate in private and so on and so forth. This is not um, what my question is about. It's actually um, speaking publicly. As a politician, I am very interested on uh, what you can blog without uh, getting into trouble and whether you can uh, do that uh, anonymously also. Um, uh, got lost, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, um, there has been a lot of uh, regulation on that. Uh, they want you to use your own name. They want to verify that. and. Uh, this comes to the question about um, your reliability, whether the people can, uh, can uh, judge you based on you. You are, you are putting yourself on the line when you're using your own name. But is that really required? Uh, are all the people required to judge other people's writing based on, on their prior reputation, based on, on themselves putting their name on the line? Mm -hmm. uh, where is critical thinking nowadays? Is it really so that people cannot look at what is being written, uh, use multiple sources, uh, just use their own thinking to, to um, figure out if that information is correct? Why do we need the state to protect uh, that? Why do we need, uh, the, the media in Finland, they will give, give you one truth. If you want something else, you have to read the Wall Street Journal or uh, international media or blogs or something else. If you read the media, you only get one truth. But uh, good people uh, have different opinions and uh, di different um, facts and base their, um, their personal opinion based, based on, uh, on, on multiple sources. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. So. John, you've been in the media for a long time. Uh, the balance between anonymity and uh, other sources of vetting and uh, reputation and credibility. Well, I mean, I think uh, um, if I understood the gentleman correctly, coming from uh, Finland, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, there's. I can't see if you're writing a, a political blog in Finland. I can't see the particular requirement for anonymity. I mean, I've always worked from the assumption that pretty much anything anything you put in an email. Um, you know, if you if you don't want it to appear in the pages of a newspaper, don't put it on an email. Um, and the same the same with with a blog. I think it's entirely different in in uh, countries such as Guatemala, in, in countries where uh, the issue of uh, of uh, personal protection and and security um, are at stake. But the right to anonymity 
is surely uh, an inviolable one, but the politician who writes anonymously is probably not a politician uh, in a Western country is very confident of their opinions. <laughs> Stuart, do you have any final word on anonymity? I'm going to defer to Newman. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, I, nobody should be forced to write anonymously anywhere in any place. That's, that's obvious, and government sh should ensure that. However, we need to be, we need to distinct, uh, we need to make the distinction between the law and the practice of the law. For example, the gentleman is f in, from Finland, and Finland, you in, in, your, in your ID cards, there is much more information than anybody in Europe would like it to have, and I'd like Tunisia to be like Finland, so I have no problem, I have no problem for me, for to put I in the ID cards the information you have, as long as we ensure that the use of the information will be as strict as it, as it should be. So uh, no anonymity, write your name, and uh, if somebody is, um, will put you in jail because what you think, we will be all for you, and we will go and, did it <laughs> and get you out of jail. I mean, <laughs> I, it's, it's obvious, we should not be forced to write anonymous stuff on the internet. And internet should not be governed by internationally by politicians, but it should not be governed by lobbyist group neither. And I would r recommend to Google as well for the, all the agreement they do with governments, with, with governments to put on the, to publish the agreement, the details agreement on how they deliver the data, maybe they are doing, by the way, uh, the data to that, c in which condition they will accept to deliver the, uh, the personal information to that particular government. Okay. Um, maybe it's being done. I don't know. If it is done, it's good. If it is not being done, please do it. Okay, so on that note, a challenge to our hosts to conclude this debate and this first session. Uh, thank you all so much. I think uh, we're not going to take a vote because my guess is that, Stuart, you don't have that many converts here. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's one takeaway I have from a, from a li lively and important conversation. So I want to thank all of our panelists and all of you and wish you uh, a good two days to come. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.